Now we come to the last speaker of this session um, from my group, uh, Kerstin Riem. Um, she is associate professor at our uh, center and um, is in charge of the outpatient clinic there. Her focus is mainly in translational medicine, translating risk prediction or, or risk yeah, prediction into clinical care. And she's speaking about the challenges of risk-adjusted prevention for breast cancer. Please, Kerstin. Yes, thank you for the um, introduction and many thanks to the organizers to invite me for this very interesting and innovative meeting. So um, I want to give you a brief overview of my um, talk and these are the topics. I first want to present the state of art in breast cancer heritability, then uh, focus on some research gaps in clinical translation and at the end of my talk I want to hold a plaidoyer for conjoint um, European actions. As we know for a long time, approximately 30 to 40 percent of common solid tumors are associated with hereditary risk factors, as you can see here, for example, for prostate and colon cancer. And breast cancer genetics could serve as a paradigm for other solid tumors. As you heard in the talks before, only 5% of uh, breast cancers are um, caused by um, BRCA1 and 2 mutations and approximately 20% of familial aggregation will be explained by these mutations. Although numerous other uh, risk genes have been recently identified, approximately 50% of familial aggregation of breast cancer is still unexplained. And you saw this picture in Doug's talk as um, accumulating data support the um, hypothesis that we have a um, frequent uh, number of uh, risk genes and they are only rarely mutated and we can be sure that the projects like Horizon 2020, the Bridget project, is able by exomic sequencing and validation in large prospective cohorts that new genes will be identified. And in the future, the, we as clinicians will be able to predict personal risk for each individual at a risk scale as you can see here. And this fits perfectly to our clinical experience. Here you see prospective data from the German consortium screening program, the intensified German-wide screening program um, from this consortium. And uh, you see uh, the red line. These are patients from um, BRCA1 and 2 negative families. And you can see the very low um, incidence rates for breast cancer compared to the very high disease penetrance in BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers are patients and women who can um, afford for um, prophylactic bilateral mastectomy while patients and women from the BRCA1 and 2 negative families um, could more or less prefer the surveillance program. And another very important essential information for the persons um, at risk and mutation carriers is um, the phenotype correlation, which phenotype would be associated with a special genotype. That means, for example, as we heard before, and it's a very complex theme, but to make it a little bit easier, BRCA1 uh, mutations are associated mainly with triple negative breast cancers. This is a problem, um, problematic tumor, and it's not easy to handle for clinicians and is associated with a poor prognosis. BRCA2 two, uh, mutations are associated with uh, luminal B tumors. And RAD51C is a moderate risk gene uh, which is, uh, has been identified in the German consortium in 2010. And uh, we now know that the RAD51C gene is associated with luminal A breast cancers. That means for an individual, 
for BRCA1 mutation carriers, they have to expect a triple negative breast cancer and they are more interested in going to um, prophylactic bilateral mastectomy to avoid a chemotherapy. And uh, compared to that, rad 51 c patients are more interested in going to, for example, a surveillance program because it's a um, tumor associated with a very good prognosis. So it's very um, important to know which genotypes defines which phenotype and the clinical disease cause in the future. It's not only important uh, to know the um, the risk prediction of a gene, but also the prediction of which tumor type will be developed. And the genotype is therefore relevant for clinical decisions on the uptake of preventive measures, not only, but also for therapeutic measures. How can we transfer these data into the clinical arena? And here I think I can present you some uh, dramatic development. These are data from the California Breast Cancer Registry, more than 180,000 uh, patients from the general population. And as you can see here, the dramatic increase in prophylactic bilateral mastectomy compared to the decrease of breast conserving therapy. And needless to say, there is no decrease in mortality for these patients, but uh, you can assume there is a huge increase in morbidity for these patients. And uh, this development um, was foreseen from the World Health Organization when they revisited the Wilson and Youngner screening criteria in the genomic age. And I want to cite Although genetic services and screening programs aim to improve the health of the population, there is growing concern that the increasing number of genetic tests becoming available at lower costs could compromise the viability of the healthcare system. Even though the tests themselves may be expensive and suitable for large-scale use, the infrastructure and human resources needed to provide appropriate education, counseling, intervention and follow-up are likely to be far more costly. And again, how can we transfer these data into uh, appropriate uh, clinical use? And uh, while we have received a lot of clinical and analytic valid validity, we have a severe lack in clinical utility of these data. For example, um, how could doctors communicate risk and patients and women families could understand this? What are the effective um, interventions? What are the benefits? And we need pilot trials uh, to find out which are the um, best and um, risk adapted um, preventive measures. And last but not least, the big topic of ethical, legal and social implications on all of that. So um, we started an initiative called Risk App Initiative funded by the German Federal Ministry of Health this year. And we uh, grounded an international and interdisciplinary expert group which establish a framework for risk-adjusted prevention strategies on a meta level. And this is based on the position paper on risk-adjusted prevention of the National Cancer Plan. And uh, the project is associated to the CanCon Work Package 9 on the organization, governance and evaluation of cancer screening. And from this, we extracted some very um, needful suggestions uh, conjoined for conjoint actions on the EU level. And uh, we need these action items. And um, we suggested, for example, to consolidate um, and cross-link quaternary care centers for familial cancers. Therefore, we need standards in counseling, genetic testing, and clinical interpretation. We suggest to establish familial cancer registries, including genetic databases, as prerequisites for the interpretation of genetic test results. And um, 
we need for preventive and also th therapeutic measures, prospective cohorts to get um, evidence. We suggest to provide educational programs to improve genetic and preventive literacy of doctors and persons at risk. And quaternary prevention should avoid over-prevention and secure that patients could go into a preference-sensitive shared decision-making process. Last but not least, um, we suggest to define rights and obligations for the uptake of risk-adjusted prevention. Um, and uh, this would lead to distributive justice and prevention. So this is my last plenary for that, and I thank uh, all the members of the German Consortium for Hereditary Breast and um, Ovarian Cancer, the German Ministry of Health for supporting the Risk App um, initiative, the German Cancer Aid, uh, which supports uh, all the projects from the German Consortium till 20 years now, the Cologne Center for Ethics, Right, Economics and Social Sciences of Health, and last but not, last but not least, the BRCN Network, with this, uh, which is the self-help group um, and is nationwide um, um, working and supporting all the work also of the German Consortium. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kerstin. Are there questions? Okay. Uh, yes, Christoph? So, um, how far along are we? sort of in, in Germany and EU-wide in collecting the information on the familial cases, like what percentage um, do we really have data on at the current point in time? Question on what percentage, what did you say, Christoph? What, what percentage of the patients actually affected do we really have data on and are really in those care centers in Germany and EU-wide? I may have missed that, you may have stated that, but I just wanted to get an idea. You mean estimation, how many of them mm -hmm. are in our centers? Maybe there was... Maybe I can maybe answer they, this. I no, I, I don't have a, a um, real answer, but maybe we can talk about the checklist yeah. project, which shows that we have 25, approximately 25 patients. We have patients. collected, yeah, but maybe we have collected uh, now in the consortium, by the end of this year, we will have collected 25,000 families tested. Um, I've seen data on the tests uh, in the general population and can extract from that that the consortium covers about half of the tests um, of in, in, in Germany. And with respect to intensified prevention, or with respect to prevention, I have no idea what's going on uh, with respect to the prophylactic surgery. I think we are better than um, what was seen with respect to the California Cancer Registry, because I think we put already a lot of effort in teaching doctors going to the meetings and explaining that this is not uh, um, that, that this should be a well discussed decision. And with respect to intensified surveillance, we are in the advantage that MRI is only covered by our special contracts. So this actually forces women and doctors to send them over, and that's the way how we get uh, our uh, prospective data. So I think we are on a quite good way and quite good structured. 